I'd like you to turn to Romans 16, first of all. Romans 16. Can we pull those doors back there? Because I'd like us to begin with this prayer or benediction with which Paul closes the book of Romans and make that our opening prayer today. So let's read Romans 16, verses 25 through 27, and then we will pray based on it. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Notice that is, a, that is a very complicated sentence that Paul has put together there. But if you notice how verse 25 begins, it's now to him who is able to strengthen you. And everything from there all the way down to the beginning of verse 27 tells you what it is that God uses to strengthen you. See, there are two according to's. The first is according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So the first thing God uses to strengthen you is the gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ. And then the second according to is this big, long bundle of thoughts Paul puts together. According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all the nations. And that was according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Whew, what's that? It's the gospel again. <laughs> just viewed through Paul's big theological lens. So what is it that God uses to strengthen you? The preaching of Jesus Christ, the preaching of the gospel. So what would you do if you were going to try to have a spiritual renewal week? Well, hopefully preach Jesus Christ, preach, preach the gospel with the goal that to the only wise God would be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. So let's pray that as we begin. Father, we come to you now seeking that strengthening that according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to your plans that have now been disclosed and made known to all the nations, your purpose to bring about the obedience of faith in Gentiles like us, we pray that you would strengthen us with those things and that the result would be to you, the only wise God, would be glory, eternal glory, because of all that you are for us in Jesus Christ. Well, that is our prayer as we come to your word now and begin this study. We pray through Jesus. Amen. All right, to turn over to Romans 12 now. So the first 11 chapters of Romans display God's plans and purposes in salvation and explain God's actions in salvation, and they do that in more detail than any other part of the Bible. And those 11 chapters come to kind of a mountain peak of a conclusion in Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And you say, wow. But now what? I mean, on one hand, you'd think Romans might end right there. But at the same time, you read that and there's a sense that Romans can't end right there. Somehow there has to be a response to that. And what's interesting is Romans 11, 33 to 36 are a very common set of verses. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 are a very common pair of verses. And they're often left disconnected from each other as if they don't just flow right together. So this is the response, Romans 12, 1. 
So let's read Romans 11.36 into 12.1. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's the response. So we'll be studying these two verses in each of our five studies together. So that's 9.30, 10.30 this morning, 6 o'clock tonight, 7 o'clock Tuesday and Thursday on GBC Live. So what we're going to do now in this opening time is just try to get an overview and help us get started thinking about wrapping our minds around the text as a whole and then thinking about how would you go about applying a text like this. And then in the next service, we'll start to dig into some of the details. So this will probably feel a little bit overwhelming at first. There are a lot of key words and key concepts packed into those two little verses. But remember, we have four more times to study this, okay? So we're just trying to get the big picture now at 9.30 this morning. So what you see in your booklet is that you have a little chart that just kind of works through the phrasing of the two verses. And all we're doing this morning is just getting little ideas about what these things mean, a little start, and we'll come back and get more details. But you can, if you have something you want to write down in these boxes, you can. And the way, reason I say it that way is it's not like I have a right answer for you to put in each of those boxes. So don't get frustrated if you don't know what to put, put in there. It just gives you space to take notes if you'd like to as we overview this. So he begins in verse 1 by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. Okay, so this is addressed to brothers, and as the ESV note reminds us, that word encompasses brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul is writing to his family, his spiritual family, his brothers and sisters in God's household. So this is a family appeal. That's the nature of it. He appeals, is the word that ESV uses, to his brothers and sisters. So what is that? An appeal like that has authority, but it's not the kind of order a boss would give to an employee. It's not really that category of thing. It is, it is strong and it is urgent, yet it's an appeal. It has actually a warmth to it. And most importantly, it has reasons behind it. The appeal is by the mercies of God. It's not just a random command. It's an appeal based on God's mercies. And the word therefore, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, shows us that he's referring back to the mercies that he's already been teaching them about. So he's saying, therefore, my brothers and sisters, based upon all the mercies of God that I've been teaching you about, I appeal to you. And what's the appeal? Present your bodies as a sacrifice. And when you see that word present, you can picture a worshiper coming to the temple with a sacrifice in their hands. I remember, I will never forget being in I don't even know where I was, somewhere in Taiwan. Uh, and some of you saw this picture when I came back from that trip, the altar to the God and the box of whoopie pies, you know, cheapo grocery store dessert cakes that some worshiper had brought, they had presented to their God. Can you picture that person bringing their whoopie pie box to their God? Okay, that is the picture when you, bring the, when you hear the word present. Someone presenting something to God, coming to present a sacrifice. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, based upon all the mercies of God that I've been teaching you about, I appeal to you to come present a sacrifice to God. And what is the sacrifice? Thankfully, it's a little more weighty here. It is your body. And that means more than just your physical body but it includes your body. 
It means present all that you are, including your body, as a sacrifice to God. So what's the sacrifice? It's us. It's all of us. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, based upon all the mercies of God that I've been teaching you about, I appeal to you to come present a sacrifice to God, and that sacrifice should be your whole self, body included. And Paul then gives three adjectives to describe that sacrifice. It should be living, it should be holy, and acceptable to God. Okay, so first of all, living. The sacrifice happens while you're alive. It's the sacrifice of your life, not your death. So it is somehow living, and and yet it's somehow dying at the same time. Secondly, it's holy. Holy here means, doesn't mean pure, though that is a related idea, but it means set apart for God. And I think the easiest way to picture that is uh, to picture our worshiper bringing his whoopie pie box, setting it on the altar, and then saying, oh, wait, 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 there's another God over here that I want to give this to, actually. Sorry. Sorry and stick it on this altar over here. No, 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 oh, wait, 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 wait. No, I'm going to give it to you, right? You see the divided loyalty there? To whom are you presenting your offering? Holy means it's set apart for God alone. That's the only altar that it is placed upon, the only sacrifice to that God. So holy means it is set apart. It is on only one altar, only God's. And thirdly, it is acceptable to God. And that means it is pleasing to him. No one would bring a sacrifice to their God that they didn't think their God would like. Probably our whoopie pie worshiper likes whoopie pies. And so they think, therefore, God, in my own image, as we all do with gods, probably likes them too. You bring to your God a sacrifice you think he will like. So the great news in Romans 12.1 is that the sacrifice of your whole self pleases God. It is pleasing to him. Living, holy, and acceptable. Okay, so let's summarize it again. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, based upon all the mercies of God that I've been teaching you about, I appeal to you to come present a sacrifice to God. That sacrifice should be your whole self, body included. It should be living. It should be set apart for God alone. And if so, it is going to please him. Now, verse 1 ends by adding, that this sacrifice is your spiritual worship. And you'll see, if you are looking at the ESV, you'll see a footnote there that says, or your rational service. Uh, It is a difficult pair of words to translate in Greek because they mean several things that all all those meanings seem to fit. Um, But I tend to think that the word worship here refers to worship. And that the word spiritual here, that the ESV is taken as spiritual, refers to reasonable and thoughtful worship. And I'll explain that more in the next service. But for now, the point is that when we bring our whole selves to God, that is worship. And because of all of his mercies to us, we can do that thoughtfully and reasonably. It is not a random and senseless order to obey. As you think through the gospel in Romans 1 through 11, there is a very reasonable conclusion. One great, big, reasonable conclusion. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. That is the logical, rational, reasonable, thoughtful conclusion from the gospel itself. Now, verse 2 tells us how a living sacrifice lives. There are two parts to it, much like two sides of the same coin. First, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be squeezed into the world's mold. And the word world is the, it's the same word we just saw in Hebrews 1, if you're watching the Hebrews live studies. It's ion, the word for age. It's referring to this present evil age. Don't be squeezed into the mold of this present evil age. That would definitely not be a pleasing sacrifice to God. This world is characterized by its rejection of God. So don't be conformed. 
A living sacrifice resists conformity to this world, but instead be transformed. And for now, just note the passive. Be transformed. Isn't it, aren't passive commands interesting? Do something that you can't do. Be transformed by God. God has to do it, and yet the command is to us to let God transform us. And we'll talk later about what that means. But Paul tells us here what kind of transformation he's talking about. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So it's a transformation in the way that you think. How does a living sacrifice live? Well, at the very heart of it is how they think. The person whose life is dedicated as a sacrifice to God has a mind that is changing. It is learning to think differently than the people of this present evil age think. And in particular, they are learning how to test and discern, you see how verse 2 continues, how to test and discern how to live the way God would want. How to test and discern how to live according to God's will. So how does a living sacrifice live? Well, they live resisting conformity to the world, but with their thinking being transformed to think God's ways, to see God's way, to make choices in line with God's will. And the end of verse 2 says that those choices aligned with God's will will be good and acceptable and perfect. They will be good choices. They will be acceptable choices to God, that which means, again, they will please Him. And they will be perfect. Ah, that's such a hard word to translate into English. I think when we read that, we think, we could think something like, uh, oh, great, if I'm going to bring my life as a sacrifice to God, I've got to make perfect choices. Uh, which is not at all what the idea is here. It means that if you present yourself to God as a sacrifice and your thinking is transformed, you're going to learn to choose those things that are the very best, the mature things, the Christ-like things. In other words, you will less and less choose what just gets by. You will less and less choose what, you know, will just kind of keep your Christian friends happy so they think you're doing well. And you will instead more and more choose the very best things for the glory of God and for the will of God. That, I think, is what perfect means. So let me just read for you then my own summary of the text. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, based upon all of the mercies of God that I've been teaching you, I appeal to you to come present a sacrifice to God. That sacrifice should be your whole self, body included. That sacrifice should be living and set apart for God alone, and if so, it will please Him. This sacrifice is your worship, thoughtful, reasonable worship. And to live this life as a sacrifice, you must not be shaped by the way that this present evil age thinks, but rather let your mind be transformed by God so that you think and choose in new ways, testing and discerning the will of God. And those choices will be good. They will be acceptable to God. They will be perfect, the best choices. All right, that's a lot. You can see why we're taking five times to study this. And we'll come back to each of those parts a little more slowly between now and Thursday. I'd like to show you, though, a couple of other summaries from people who have worded it much better than I have. So on the bottom of page three, in a moment, don't read it yet. In a moment, we're going to read from the New Living Translation of Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I'm going to use this over and over and over again. But I want to make a quick comment about this. Um, This is something that we talked about in our series on... Um, the, the trustworthiness of God's word, and particularly when we talked about translations. Uh, the, the New Living Translation is genuinely a translation. It's a hear people call it a paraphrase, and it's not. Now, it started out as a revision of the Living Bible, and so that would have been more along the lines of a paraphrase, but it ended up being a f- new translation from the original languages. Now, it follows a translation philosophy that heavily prioritizes meaning, over form. Um, And so that has its advantages and disadvantages, and it's not a great translation for like in-depth Bible study or or preaching 
like we would do. But it does have some real advantages for other purposes. And the reason why I'm using it this morning and, and in this spiritual renewal week is because, first of all, I think they did an awesome job with Romans 12, 1 and 2. There are, there's only a spot or two where I can pick at their translation, and that's just because I have a different preference um, than the wording they chose. But second of all, I really want us to make sure we don't get our eyes starting to glaze over with the familiarity of a text. Especially if you've known Romans 12, 1 and 2 for a long time. It can just start to kind of be in one ear and out of the other. And sometimes switching to read it in a different translation is kind of like a little snap, you know, that kind of gets our attention. So that's really my purpose uh, in using it this week. So you'll see that I'm going to use it frequently. So let's read it. It's there at the bottom of page three. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's a great summary of that. And then finally, if you turn the page in your booklet, a very brief summary from Tom Schreiner. And this is not a translation, it's just a summary of the point. Give your whole self to God, for this is only reasonable. Do not be shaped by this world, but be transformed with new patterns of thinking. The result will be that you will discover God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. All right, hopefully that helps us start to see the overall meaning before we uh, dive into the details. Now, I'd like us to spend the rest of our time talking about how we would apply this. And that might seem like kind of jumping ahead to the end, but it's really important that we talk about that now, that we talk about what kind of a passage this is. What did Paul have in mind here? How did Paul um, expect the Romans to respond or hope that they would respond? And let me just suggest a couple alternatives, uh, options, and I know they all overlap, but um, I think you'll see why I'm talking through some distinctions here. Was, was Paul's purpose to teach them how to live as Christians? In other words, was this instruction to help them grow into faithful Christians? As we'll see, he goes on in Romans 12, 13, 14, 15 to give them really specific instructions about how to live as Christians and how to live as a church family. So, so are these verses kind of a basic discipleship? Like, look, here's how you, here's how you live as a Christian. And obviously that's true, um, but, but here's another way to think about it. Was Paul, though, hoping that they would make a decisive decision? Like, was Paul seeing that every Christian needs to reach a point where he presents his whole life to God as a sacrifice? And so was Paul hoping that everyone in the Roman church, if they had not presented their whole life as a sacrifice to God, would do that? Was he thinking about a decisive decision? Or was he calling them to a, like a rededication? You know, I'm, 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 if, if, if there's anything that has been said about Romans 12, 1 and 2 a million times, it's that the problem with living sacrifices is that they tend to crawl off the altar, right? <laughs> That's kind of the most, the most cliche thing you can possibly say about these verses, though it's true, right? So was that what Paul had in mind? Was he writing to the Romans thinking, now you've probably all crawled off the altar in some ways, and so I'm appealing to you to get back on, to present your life again to God. So what did Paul have in mind? How did he hope they would respond? Can you see how the way you're thinking about that might affect how you respond to this, how you think about all of this study? 
You know, if, if, your, if your thinking is this is calling for a one-time decision, then if you've already made that decision, you might kind of yawn and say, I know Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I already did that, you know, and wait for next Sunday. Um, if the goal is to generally instruct in Christian living, you might not even consider that God might want you to make a decisive decision to present your whole life to him. So um, that's why I'm trying to talk about that now. So, so how did Paul hope the Romans would respond? Well, the first thing we ought to do is see if the passage tells us, right? Does the passage help us know what response he was looking for? And um, I, you, you're probably not going to be at all surprised by my answer, which is yes, right? But I think the passage shows us that Paul left the door open for a diversity of responses. Um, so first of all, there is plenty of evidence here for a response that is an ongoing daily way of living, not just a decisive decision. Um, and the most obvious of those is that the verb tense is in verse 2, don't be conformed, be transformed. Those are present tenses that indicate ongoing activities. It's going to be an ongoing process of resisting the conformity and letting God transform you. He, he talks there about the renew, renewal of your mind. He's definitely not talking about a one-time event there, but something that is a gradual process of your mind continually growing, changing into the image of Christ step by step, thinking less like this age and more like, like God would have us think. So clearly there's, there's something ongoing there. And then all of the instructions and the rest of like Romans 12 are daily Christian living kind of instructions. You know, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Uh, don't be proud, associate with the lowly, and, and so on. So <clears throat> certainly what Paul's calling for here, we need to make sure we don't just think of a, a one-time decision and I'm done. Um, I like, the, I like the little phrase from Ann Voskamp, live given. Uh, live, it's your lifestyle, it's every day. Live every day given to God, presented to God, and thus given to others as well. So, so there's plenty of evidence here that the response is supposed to be uh, an ongoing, this is the way a Christian lives. Yet, at the same time, nothing here excludes the possibility of a decisive moment of decision or decisive moments of decision. Verse 1 says, present your bodies. Now, that's just a, a simple heiress tense that could mean a lot of things, um, but it certainly could suggest that you need to make a decision about it. And surely... If, if part of the point of the passage is that this is your reasonable, thoughtful worship, that suggests you think about it and make a decision. You think about the gospel, you think about Romans 1 through 11, and you come to a conclusion. I'm going to take my sacrifice and I'm going to go take it to God. I'm going to take the sacrifice of my life because that's the right response to this. So I think there is implied there a kind of a decisive decision. And obviously, if there is a decisive decision implied that we probably all need to make as believers, then there will need to be some more decisive decisions along the way. Because we will, in particular areas, crawl back off the altar and not realize it, and then realize it by God's Spirit through His Word, and come back to the Lord with a particular area of our life and say, here, God, yours. I'm, I'm sorry, I took it. I took it for mine. But then there's something else there. See, what's going to happen is, as our thinking is renewed, it's, it's not just about the sacrifice crawling off of the altar. It's, it's the parts of the sacrifice that never actually made it onto the altar. And as our thinking is renewed we see more areas of our life that really they've maybe never been God's. Um, the way I picture it, and it, there, every illustration has its faults, and I, I know this one does, um, but the way I picture it is if you picture your, room, your life like a room and God's work in your life like a, a single light bulb shining this brightness down to the middle of that room, um, as as you grow in the Lord, the light expands. 
and it reaches further and further into the corners of that room. And so at, at any given moment, you may feel like you see all that needs to be given to the Lord in your life. But, you know, a year or two later, you might have grown in your thinking. The light might have expanded some more and you might have seen some new areas that really needed to be brought and presented to the Lord. So there will be that kind of response as, as well, where we say, wow, Lord, here's something. I, I, I really had given my whole life to you, but I'd never thought about this. I had never thought about that area, those decisions, that part of my life. Here, here, it's yours. I give it to you. So, um, so the bottom line in what I'm saying is that we might respond to this passage in many different ways. It is possible that for someone here, these things are new. I mean, they don't know Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I, it's, it's so fun to get to teach the Bible with those kind of people here with us, you know? I love that. And to hear the stuff they say in grace groups, and it's fun. And it's possible for someone here, they will hear Romans 12, 1 and 2, and they will say, I didn't even know about that. I, I never heard this idea of presenting my life as a living sacrifice to God, but I want to do that because I know what God's done for me. So you bet. Here I come, Lord. Here's my life. Have it. So somebody may make that just kind of, this is new. I want to do that kind of decisive decision. For someone else, it might be more sober where they do need to bring their whole life to God, but they have known that. And they have been in rebellion against God. And they see their sin and they know, wow, I, I have got to submit to the Lord. I have got to bring my life to Him because I have been holding on to my life for me and I've known it. And so that will be, again, a kind of decisive decision, yet in a more sober way. So some may make a definitive decision to present their whole life to God. And then I think there will be some of you who will find yourself saying to the Lord, can I just tell you again that my whole life is yours? You know, I, I, some of you have known Romans 12, 1 and 2 for uh, many decades. But you say, Lord, I've known this for a long time, but I am still so grateful for all you've done for me in Christ. And I just want you to know again, I just joyfully give myself to you anew today. So I, surely there will be some of that kind of response. But what I hope you won't do is get paralyzed trying to figure out, have I or haven't I? Did I really dedicate my whole life to the Lord or did I not? That will not help you to get kind of paralyzed there and stuck. Um, if you start to get that kind of, and, and some of you, that would never cross your mind. And some of you, you're just a personality that's like that. You overthink everything. You hyperanalyze everything. And you could get paralyzed this week trying to figure out, did I, did I, did I, did I, did I, didn't I? And I would just say, if that's where you find yourself stuck, just say, just set aside your hyperanalysis and go to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I'm yours. Now, if there are areas in my life that are not, would you show me, right? And, and focus on the specifics because for most of us, it's probably going to come down to some specifics that we need to present to God. It's probably going to come down to some things where right now, at, at 10 o'clock on this Sunday morning, you don't even know. You're completely unaware of where God's going to shine his light in your heart in the next five days. But he's going to. And when he does, our hearts need to say, okay, Lord, that is yours. I, I have been floating along with the thinking of this present age. And I don't want to do that anymore. I want to think your way about that part of my life. And so here, I give it to you. It's yours. So the response may be a definite decision about our whole life. It may be the presentation of some particular parts of our lives. It may be a representation of some parts of our lives. But let's make sure, finally, that we don't miss the point that this passage is about your overall mindset about life. This is a big picture passage, and we can't miss that big picture do not think of Romans 12, 1 and 2 as one of many commands for a Christian to obey or as one of many areas of life that a Christian could think about. This passage is about our entire mindset, 
our entire way of thinking and living in Christ. This is about our entire worldview. So whatever practical, specific applications we reach, they should be, they must be, because God is renewing our entire way of thinking about life as a Christian. Let me quote from Douglas Moo, as you see on your handout. This is one of the best known passages in the New Testament. Its fame is justified because here Paul succinctly and with vivid imagery summarizes what the Christian response to God's grace in Christ should be. This summarizes our entire response to God's grace. It's that big. And this becomes clear when we, I'm gonna, we're going to look at three things that clarify that, okay? That make, help us see how big this is. First of all, we see how big this is when we see how it fits into the book of Romans. These fit right at the turning point. They are the turning point in the book of Romans. The first 11 chapters of Romans are like no other portion of Scripture. They detail the purposes and the actions of God in salvation like no other part of the Bible. And you get through all of that and then you hit a hinge. And Paul suddenly turns and he goes right to the application of what all that means. And this is the hinge. The apostle who taught us the gospel more clearly and in more detail than anybody else hinged the entire response to the gospel on this, on you presenting your whole life to God as a sacrifice. And then he goes on in Romans 12 through 15, and he gives detail after detail after detail about what that response would look like. But this is the big picture of it. And so the location of these verses in Romans shows us that they give us the essence of how we respond to the love of God. So, you know, Jesus loves me. That song has a chorus, right? Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. But Romans 12, 1 and 2 could be the chorus for Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They're weak, but he is strong. And so, I appeal to you, come present your whole life as a sacrifice to God. It's the response to, yeah, Jesus loves me. And actually, that's there. If you've heard some of the other verses of Jesus loves me, the last verse is Jesus uh, Jesus. The last two phrases of the last verse are, Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. That's it. That is the point. Because Jesus loves me, Romans 12, 1 and 2 is the way we respond. And so you see why I say this isn't just one of many commands for a Christian to obey. This is about our entire way of thinking and living, our entire response (laughs) to the gospel. That's one way we see how big it is. Another way we see that is by remembering how these verses reverse man's cursed rebellion at the beginning of Romans. They take that awful, blasphemous idolatry and flip it upside down. Go to Romans 1 and let me show you this. Romans 1, verse 25 They exchanged the truth of God, truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So what is at the very heart of mankind of what is wrong with mankind is that we've gotten everything backward. We've taken the creation, especially ourselves, and worshiped it, and we've replaced the creator who truly deserves our worship. As we said last Sunday, the center of the biblical worldview is the glorious God, and at the center of man's worldview is man. And the gospel reverses that. It puts God back at the center So watch again. Go to Romans 11. We're going to go back to Romans 1 in a minute, but go to Romans 11 again. Watch how this happens. Romans 
Romans 11, 36. Once you get to the end of 11 chapters of God's purposes and actions and salvation, the conclusion is that God is at the center from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. I appeal to you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your worship. Do you see how that flows? Romans 1, man at the center, God kicked to the curb. End of Romans 11, God at the center. So now take your life that you once put at the center of your universe and bring your whole life to God as your worship. That takes Romans 1 and it flips it right back the way it ought to be. God at the center of the world and our lives. Now, we can see this one other way. Back to Romans 1. And actually, can you just keep a hand in Romans 12? Or put a hand in Romans 12 so we can go right back there? Let's read Romans 1, 28, and then go right to Romans 12, 2. Okay? Romans 1, 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Now Romans 12, 2. A debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Now Romans 12, 2. As you present your whole self as, to God as a sacrifice, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do you see how that flips Romans 1, 28 right on its head? Instead of a debased mind rejecting God, living in all kinds of sin and idolatry and blasphemy, now our mind is transformed to choose the very best things that please God for His glory. So can you see again how Romans 12, 1 and 2 is not little? It's not just one of many commands, not just one of many exhortations. It is the summary of it all, the heart of our response to God's love the essence of what it means to be changed from an idolater to a worshiper. So, this is Spiritual Renewal Week, and we are not seeking little renewal. We're seeking big renewal. We're seeking the overhaul of our entire thinking for the glory of God from the gospel. We're seeking God's change at the very core of how we think about life as a Christian and how we respond to his love for us in Christ.